Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Ecology. I hope you had a wonderful weekend. So this here is our last ecology lesson of the semester. Um, I hope you enjoy. Um, I've added some extra research article links if you are interested. Um, and another thing to kind of look into if you are interested about this whole um, concept about DDT and how it started to become banned, et cetera, et cetera, compared to its wide, widespread use in the 1950s and 60s. Um, uh, Rachel Carson's A Silent Spring is a book that she wrote that kind of created this whole wave of anti-DDT movement. Um, so if you are interested. Okay, so let's begin on our last ecology lesson. Okay. So here we go. Pests and pesticides. What is a pest? Now, the actual definition of a pest is any kind of plant, animal, organism that can cause illness, harm, or annoyance. But there's one more factor in that definition. So what is it causing illness, harm, or annoyance to? So in this case, it would be to humans. Humans is the key component when we're trying to define a pest. Because ultimately, an insect is not a pest. It is a pest by our standards. Every organism in this planet, on this planet is just doing what it can to try to survive. And so yes, by our, our standards, whether it causes illness to us, harm to us, or simply annoyance by eating our crops, we would call it a pest. So it is a very broad definition and it can incorporate plants, animals, or any kind of organism ultimately, okay? So let's take a look at the risk that a pest can pose upon our agro-ecosystems. So we've done this before where we've looked, analyzed what an agro-ecosystem is. Um, so we're gonna do this example again, but we're going to compare a specific grassland ecosystem to a potato field. Okay, so a potato crop, let's say. So here's an image of a grassland ecosystem. Take a look at it. And here is an image of what a potato crop might look like. Okay, so now let's do a comparison. Let's analyze first the difference in the quantity of producers. So in a grassland versus a potato field, the producers, how many species of plants do you expect to see in a grassland? And then how many species of plants do you expect to see in a potato field? Okay. So I'm gonna give you a hint about a potato field. You might say one, but in fact, there are always a handful of plants, even in one type of an agro ecosystem. What kind of plants do you think those are? What might we categorize them as? So we would categorize them as weeds. So let's compare. So if you're looking at a grassland, you're gonna have somewhere from 50 to 100 species of plants. A lot of biodiversity there. Any kind of agro ecosystem, if you're planting one crop, we also call it a monoculture, one culture. But you do have more than one because there are weeds that are growing. And I mean, this kind of creates one of the reasons why we use pesticides, right? Why we would use a herbicide. We are trying to also wipe out any of those additional weeds because we truly are trying to create a one crop culture. Okay, herbivores now. What kind of um, herbivores would you find in a grassland? So kind of write down a few examples. And if you're in a potato field, what kind of herbivores would you find there? Okay, so if you're in a grassland, you'll find your insects, your spar sparrows, ro um, rodents, burrowing animals, etc. But the herbivores that you might find in a potato field are organisms that like to eat potato crop. Okay, and this, these are our pests. Okay, so certain herbivores, it could even be, let's say, rabbits. Okay, but also different insects. There are literally beetles called potato beetle, okay? They've been, they are named after the fact that they like to eat potatoes, okay? They're, so they're essentially pests that's specified for that specific crop. Flea beetle, corn beetle, insects that eat that crop. 
And yes, you will find possibly some types of rodents that can also eat that crop as well. But usually you'll have an overwhelming quantity of pests in terms of insects. Okay, carnivores. So think about a grassland. Write down a few carnivorous animals or organisms. And now think about that potato field. Would you find any carnivores in a potato field? So in this case, for carnivores, you will find things like foxes, snakes, hawks, spiders, insects, carnivorous insects as well. But in terms of a potato field, carnivores are rare sightings. And then the food web between a grassland and a potato field, ultimately in a potato field, you have your food chain, not even a web anymore. You have your producer, the crop, and the pests that feed upon it. Okay, so feel free to pause if you need to write the rest of this down. Okay, so now let's analyze a cornfield. Why is this an ideal environment? Pretend you are a pest. Why is this an ideal, an ideal environment for you? So let me show you an example of a pest that specializes in the corn crop. It is called the corn borer, okay? So the corn borer. So this pest loves corn, um, essentially will eat through the corn crop. It has no predators. You have no carnivores in that field, okay? So you have an abundant amount of the resource that you want to eat and no predators. So at that point, if that, if that starts to, um, sorry, if the corn borer, borer starts to reproduce, it can overtake that whole crop. And this is what we saw happening with our ash trees, right? That ash borer beetle. So it started to overtake all the ash trees. So we had to try to cut them all down, okay? All right. So what do we do to prevent this from happening? By using pesticides. Please write that down. Sorry, everything popped up at once on the next slide. How do humans prevent this from happening? By using pesticides. Okay, so now let's categorize them. What are the three major categories of pesticides? Think about it. So what are they called? The ones that try to kill plants, the ones that try to kill insects, the ones that try to kill any kind of a fungus. Okay, so here are your herbicides, insecticides, and fungicides. So I've, I've kind of did some re I've done some research and um, found out some names of these different types of pesticides. And keeping in mind that the ones that we are using now, we've transitioned into synthetic, right? Rather than natural. So our synthetic herbicide that we will typically use is glufosinate ammonium. Now let's go on to our insecticides, the ones that are killing our insects. Now this can co um, exist under two categories. It can kill the insect at its larval stage or at its ovum stage. So it can kill the eggs or kill the larva. Okay, so whether it's killing the eggs, we call it ovicicide. Sorry, ovicide, goodness me. And then larvicide, okay. So these are, are the two categories of insecticides. So some plants, for example, the tobacco plant produces nicotine, right? So nicotine actually um, is an insecticide of its own. So some plants do naturally produce this themselves, which is a great adaptation. And then let's go into our fungicides that kill fungi. And one kind of chemical that is used to kill fungi is sulfur. And of course, there's other categories. Your rodenticides, molluscicides, pesticides, avicides, algicides, miticides. So 
there's a specific name for whether or not it's killing rodents or fish or birds, algae, snails, slugs, or mites. And this is just an image to help us kind of understand the ways that insecticides can be administered, okay? So there's some differences between different categories of pesticides, okay? So the first way that they can differ is how long they can last. So I want you to kind of pause the video and take a guess. What is the shortest amount of time you think it, it, um, a pesticide can last? And what do you think might be the longest possible amount of time that a pesticide can actually remain around and functional? Okay, so here's another reason we've veered away from natural pesticides. The natural ones, they will typically only last a few days. Then they will start to decompose, degrade, okay? Other pesticides can last for months, okay? Now, there have been circumstances, and this is quite rare, but if, an uh, if a pesticide is stored in the soil, or let's say it rains and it, it goes into the soil instead, that pesticide can persist for up to a year. So one example that I found was uh, permethrin. So if it's on a plant surface, it'll last about two to six weeks, but in the soil, it can last over a hundred days. So again, this gets into this whole ecosystem issue. If you want a pesticide for a short period of time, but then it persists and remains around longer than you need it. And it remains, let's say, in the soil and it's not actually functional and you still need to spray again. Now you're, you're having huge amounts of a quantity of pesticides that are, are amplifying, amplifying, amplifying in the soil, in the crops, et cetera. <clears throat> okay, another way pesticides can differ is their, essentially their application use. So we call them broad spectrum and narrow spectrum pesticides. So what do you think the difference is here? If I say a, a, a pesticide, uh, we even say this for antibiotics, right? Uh, broad spectrum antibiotics, broad spectrum pesticides. So if it's broad spectrum, it can be toxic to many different species out there, okay? Which, I mean, it seems to be useful. DDT is something that serves that way. It's very toxic to many different species. Okay. So it's, I mean, one administration, you can wipe out a huge category of species, which sounds great um, in theory. And this is what DDT stands for. <laughs> Try it out for a second. I might, during a trivia game, get someone to say this out loud and give you a point if you can say it and give you a point if you can spell it. So spend a second, try to figure out how to say this. And here we go. Dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane. Okay. So it's literally naming the chemical ingredient that makes it up. Um, just like we were saying, what? ATP, right? Adenosine triphosphate. It's telling you that you have an adenine ring and you have three phosphate groups that makes up that chemical. Same with, same with this. DDT is dichloro, two chlorines, diphenyl, phenyl, 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 um, some sort of a phosphate attachment. And then uh, trichloro, three chlorines again, ethane. Um, ethane, I think, is some version of CH3. Oh goodness, I should have researched this before I made this up. But anyway, it is named after the chemical composition of DDT. And if you're bored, you can find out the chemical formula to kind of figure out where the naming, the nomenclature uh, is derived from. Okay, and then now narrow spectrum. It's toxic to a limited number of species. Okay, let's try an example. So this one here is called BT. So this one we use for caterpillars, beetle, flies, but only to those. And how would we say this? Bacillus thuringiensis. Okay. 
So be prepped to spell these properly during uh, trivia, okay? Okay, so how do they work? What, is the, what are the different ways that we can actually administer them, okay? Apply them to the organisms. So number one, they can cause biological harm. They can physically harm the insect, okay? So the first way is direct contact, okay? So some pesticides are actually, they're actually minuscule fossilized remains and typically of algae, okay? And they're gonna scratch the outer surface of different insects. Now the exoskeleton of an insect is made up of um, a chemical called chitin, okay? And when you scratch that, you're gonna essentially expose the inside of the insect to the elements and they will dehydrate and die. So this is one way that contact pesticides can work. So these fossilized, these hard little algae remains will scratch the chitin and then the exoskeleton will start, start to kind of destruct and expose the inside and then they will dehydrate. Another one is called a chitin synthesis inhibitor. So it'll actually prevent chitin from forming. So it'll prevent them from forming a thick exoskeleton, okay? So when they, they do shed the exoskeleton, they will not be able to grow a new one. And so they will die in that way. Okay, so this is a direct application, okay? So when it touches, it will actually kill them that way. The indirect way is if a herbicide is either sprayed into the soil and a plant takes it up into its roots and it dies when the plant takes it up. So we're trying, let's say we're trying to kill um, a weed plant. Or if it's sprayed on a plant surface, but the goal is not to kill the plant, the goal is to kill the animal that is eating the plant. Right? So that is also indirect. So, so if a herbicide is sprayed on soil and then kills the plant as it takes it up through the roots, that is indirect application. Or an insecticide is sprayed directly on a plant. Oops, sorry. Okay, or an insecticide can be sprayed directly on a plant. And after the insect actually actually ingests it, it will die, okay? So it's like a poison, it interferes with biological processes, okay? And some of them, if they are hormone-based, it will cause the insect to kind of um, grow out of control or its exoskeleton might grow faster than it. It can no longer carry its exoskeleton around. Really scary stuff if you visualize that happening to um, an insect. Okay, so in, Summary, what were the three major ways that I said pesticides could vary? They could vary in terms of this, they can vary in terms of this, and they can vary in terms of that. Okay, so pause the lesson, try to remember the three major ways a pesticide can differ. Okay, so the first one is time, how long it lasts. Some last days, some last weeks, some last months. Okay, the types of organisms it's, it affects. So the control of the species, whether it's broad or narrow spectrum. And then the last one is how exactly it's delivered. Okay, whether it's direct or indirect contact. So we've done a whole, um, the tale of two extinctions when we looked at the DDT example for bald eagles. Uh, we're going to go into this now. The issues that you can think of that arise when using pesticides. So please stop, pause. There's a bunch of different issues. They're all related to the, the issue, the, oh goodness, the application of pesticides, okay? So there's a few, pause them, try to come up with three major categories or three major problems. Okay. All right, so here we go. Three major problems. The first one 
is our non-target species. Especially when you use something like a broad spectrum pesticide, you are going to wipe out any insect or any weed or any fungus, even the ones that might we might need for, let's say, a food web to stay, to, to stay afloat, right? The next one is a concept called bioamplification. Um, I'm, I feel like you may have heard about this or bioaccumulation. You have heard about it in day-to-day -day life, um, just simply from the fact that you are supposed to avoid certain foods. Can you guys think about specifically pregnant mothers? What kind of foods are you not supposed to eat? Okay, this all has to pertains to the concept of bioamplification. And then the main issue, we hear this uh, come up when we talk about antibiotics, viruses, it's resistance. Just like bacteria can become resistant to antibiotics, okay, pesticides can become resistant to the chemicals that we use to kill them. And that is ultimately one of the biggest issues facing um, all of our healthcare systems to date, okay, whether it's pesticides or antibiotics, etc. Okay, that they can get stronger and stronger and adapt and survive the chemicals that used to kill them. Okay. So here we go. Non-target species, affecting organisms who are not meant to affect. Bioamplification, essentially it works its way up the food chain and becomes more and more concentrated as it does because some pesticides do not leave the bodies of the organism that ingests it. And then pesticide resistance. So think, the pesticide will kill off the weak, great, but if any pests are left, the ones that are left are the strongest and thereby generation by generation, they get stronger and stronger and stronger. And they have a very um, high natality, right? So very frequent birth rate. So, so they can reproduce very quickly, have large number of offspring, and they can adapt very quickly and become resistant quite quickly. Okay. So the non-target species, Sorry, um, let's see. Okay, we'll talk about this in this slide here. Okay, the non-target species, the way it kills species you're not intending to kill is if you use broad spectrum pesticides. So you might actually start killing helpful organisms. You might actually really screw up food webs if you are killing organisms that, organisms that are not intended to be killed. Sometimes the pesticide can actually kill a natural predator of the pest. So now you're trying to get rid of the pest, but you've also like indirectly killed the predator of the pest. And so you need more pesticide than you did the last time and it just gets out of hand. Okay, you can also kill non-target species if you improperly spray. If you spray the crop at the wrong time of the year when the pests aren't actually at their peak. Okay, or if you apply it inefficiently. So if you apply it in a way that half of it transfers through the air and lands on a whole other part of the, I don't know, province, this can be a problem. So you can attack non-target species by using broad spectrum pesticides or by using them improperly, spraying them at the wrong time of year. Okay. So specifically, one of the main issues that's been discussed is honeybees. If you spray insecticides at the wrong time of year and you can wipe out honeybees, this will really screw up the food web, okay? Ultimately, because they are needed for pollination. Inefficient application. So I showed you that picture of how pesticides are typically sprayed. So they're typically uh, kind of sprayed over the air using, um, um, some sort of a, a plane or something like that. But if it's sprayed through the air like that, a lot of it can get carried to other areas, okay? And if it enters the water cycle, now you have pesticides in the water as well. Okay, so I'm gonna um, investigate a pretty cool case study. 1955, there were a huge number of mosquitoes. Um, in the island of Borneo. 
Now, mosquitoes were spreading malaria, right? So, so they were trying to kill the mosquitoes to prevent the people from contracting malaria. So what they did is they introduced DDT to kill those mosquitoes to try to have um, minimize the amount of malaria in, on the island, okay? Now, there are two domino effects that occurred. Keep in mind, DDT may likely be successful in killing the mosquitoes, but DDT is broad spectrum, meaning it might kill something else. So you may not be able to guess the whole domino effect, but I want you to pause the lesson. Definitely this time, please pause it and try to come up with some sort of a situation that has a four or a seven part step process of the domino effect that this would have. Okay, so pause. Okay, my first hint to you is the first um, series of domino effects, it's going to end in a fourth step where I'm going to tell you their homes were destroyed, okay? So pause it again and try to figure out, okay, they spray DDT and yet their homes get destroyed. So pause. Okay, and the next one, unrelated series of domino effects, this one, oh man, I don't even know if you'll be able to guess this in any way. This one ends up with cats need to get flown into the island. So the next one, after spraying this DDT, for some reason, cats get flown into the island. Okay, this is one of my favorite lessons just because these case studies really help you understand that everything is interconnected in ecology and that you can't just try to mitigate one problem without another one happening as a result because everything is interconnected. Okay, so let's begin. Let's look at how did their homes get destroyed after spraying DDT. Here we go. These are their homes. So take a look at it. These are hatched roof homes. Okay. All right. So number one, you spray DDT. Yay. Mosquitoes are killed. Great. Rate of malaria drops. Awesome. So that is the an intention and the, that intention has been served. Fantastic. If it stopped there, no problem. I'm sure everyone would still be using DDT like they were in the fifties. Okay. But the problem is DDT also kills wasps. So far that's fine. It's not a honeybee. We don't really seem to care very much about those. Sounds good. Wasps though were natural predators to these things. Think about it. What might eat the roofs, the roofs, okay, of houses? <clears throat> that wasps kept these organisms in check but if you start killing out the wasps, now these other organisms start to overtake and eat the house. So wasps were natural predators of caterpillars. So now the wasps start dying, the caterpillars grow out of control, the caterpillars start eating the um, thatched roofs of the villagers and their homes got destroyed. So essentially, suddenly they started seeing, not suddenly, let's say probably 10 years later, they started noticing that their roofs were, were disintegrating. So isn't it crazy? Spraying of DDT, roofs start to disintegrate. Okay, next one. Why are cats bring, being brought in? So try to work backwards. Cats are brought in. Okay. So obviously they had some cats that something is overtaking the island that wasn't overtaking the island before. What do you think the cats are brought in to kill? Okay. Now, so those things, eh, okay, I don't think you'll be able to guess further back than that. <laughs> okay, so here we go. So step one, functional. Mosquitoes are killed. The rate of malaria contraction decreased. Yay. But... DDT is a broad spectrum pesticide killing mosquitoes and wasps and cockroaches. So this is what the domino effect was after killing of the cockroaches. Okay, 
just like we talked about with the killing of the wasp, that sounds good, right? Like a, a great thing to have happened. But the problem with this, even though cockroaches are a pest by their own standards, there are organisms that would eat those cockroaches, okay? And they start to die. So lizards ate the cockroaches. Remember, the cockroaches are dead because they are toxic with DDT. So if lizards start to eat these toxic cockroaches, they start to become toxic themselves. Now, the lizards, they're surviving, but the toxin is starting to affect their nervous system. So the lizards cannot, like, they can't slither away from their predators like they used to, okay? So lizards are now moving slowly because their nervous system is not working properly and they become easy prey for what? What do you think is eating those lizards? Okay, so the cats actually start to eat the lizards because now the cats can catch them. So dead toxic cockroaches in ingested by lizards. Lizards become toxic. They cannot move properly. The cats start to eat a large enough quantity of toxic lizards that they die. So mosquitoes are dying, cockroaches are dying, cats now are toxic enough to get uh, killed as well. So cats are dying. Okay, so think, yes, they brought in replacement cats, but it's not for, it wasn't for no reason. What do you think is happening to the island now that there are no cats around? What is overtaking the island? All right, now the rats overtook the village. And believe it or not, yes, rats are un unhygienic and can uh, carry diseases, but specifically, rats have the ability to um, transfer the plague around, believe it or not, because they carry fleas on them, which carry the plague. And of course, so you'll notice I spelled carry wrong. So rats had no predators. They overtake the village. So you fly in replacement cats to kill the rats. So ironically, rats aren't ingesting any of these DDT substances, and yet they are, because they're not essentially part of this domino effect, they're actually overtaking the village. So one more time, mosquitoes are killed, fine, but that's not even part of the domino effect. Cockroaches are also killed. Lizards eat the cockroaches. They become toxic enough to slow down, okay? Cats start to eat these extremely toxic lizards, the cats do die from toxicity. No cats means that the, the rats can overtake. The rats are overtaking the village, bringing diseases with it, specifically fleas that might carry the plague, okay? And then now you need to bring in, fly in more cats to control the rats. It's quite beautiful, actually. Um, so this is, um, so when I first read about this, I was shocked. I, I thought pretty much the plague was eradicated. Why are we discussing it? But no, there has been research found that this is um, a possibility that fleas can carry the plague. Okay, so I will post this article in our Google Classroom. Okay, so just for your interest, the plague does pop up now and again. Okay, it's tiny proportions, but it does, it is still seen somewhat in the US with the, the high population. You do see, you know, a handful of cases every year. Um, and we have found fleas with carrying the plague in Arizona. Okay, so yes, if you do have enough rats, enough fleas, you could create a new plague epidemic, specifically when we're looking at the island of Borneo, which is underdeveloped and doesn't have antibiotics, okay? So it was a real risk. Okay, let's discuss bioamplification. So before a, con uh, a chemical can make its way up a food chain, so that's what bioamplification means, it begins to accumulate in the body of the organism itself. That is called bioaccumulation, okay? So the chemical accumulates in the body of the organism throughout its lifespan, bioaccumulation. And then when the next organism on the higher trophic level ingests it, it builds in that organism and then up the food chain. 
And as it accumulates up the food chain, we call that bioamplification. Okay. Now, how does this happen? So why are pesticides staying in the bodies of some organisms? So can you guys think of in our day-to-day -day life, there are things that are um, that you cannot overdose on, and there are things that you can overdose on. If you think about vitamins, does anyone know an example of a vitamin that you literally cannot eat too much of? And tell me why. Okay, or tell yourself why. All right, so these are called water-soluble vitamins. If any kind of vitamin or even a, a pesticide is water-soluble, you essentially, you urinate it out. So vitamin C, you cannot overdose on it. When you look at other things like, let's say, iron, if it's a fat-soluble vitamin, vitamin A, D, E, these get stored in our fat cells. And these accumulate over time. You do not urinate them out. So yes, you can overdose on fat-soluble pesticides, fat-soluble vitamins, okay? So let's write this, please. So bioaccumulation is when the concentration increases in the body of that organism itself throughout their lifespan. Water-soluble vitamins, they do not accumulate because they are urinated out. Okay. But other ones are fat soluble. So they are not excreted. They remain in the fat cells of the organ organism and they can become high enough concentrations that they are toxic, i.e. DDT, okay? So therefore, the definition of bioamplification if you're ever going to define it, you need to talk about the toxin moving up the food chain and increasing in concentration, okay? Okay. Just last little note. We don't really need to worry about becoming toxic when it comes to vitamin ingestion, but toxicity due to pesticide accumulation, it is a real concern for us because we are at the top of this food chain, right? Okay. Um, so here's just an example of bioamplification. So the yellow circles represent the pest, pesticide, okay? And this yellow dot or yellow circle represents something called methyl mercury, which I will discuss in a second. Okay, so bioamplification. The increase in concentration of a substance, such as a pesticide, as it moves up the food web. So up the trophic levels. So since all organisms are part of a food chain, whatever toxins are stored in the fats of the trophic level before it are passed to the trophic level above it. Okay, so think about for humans specifically, if you eat too much of this, we have the risk of becoming toxic. So we are suggested to kind of minimize the amount of times we eat this, but specifically pregnant women uh, were kind of more stickler about this. So they're trying to suggest that they stay away from fish, okay, and specifically raw fish. Does anyone know what it is in the fish? What toxin is in the fish that has stayed within the fish fat cells? That is mercury. So the question is this, how is mercury in our food web, okay? I'm gonna show you another video today talking again about how plastic, <laughs> uh, remember with the microplastics, how it gets into our food web. But now, obviously, mercury has made its way to the top of the food web, so how has this happened? Okay, so I'm gonna post another article here. Um, essentially, you know how um, nitrogen is useless until bacteria convert it to nitrate and then it is useful and can take, be taken up by the organism? Okay, um, that was a lot of words. Mercury does the same. Mercury cannot be taken up by organisms until bacteria convert it into a form called methyl mercury. Okay, and without bacteria, mer mercury would not be poisonous to us. But in a methyl mercury form, it can be taken up by organisms and stored in their fat cells and work their way up the food chain, okay? 
So here's the question. How did Mercury get into the ecosystem in the first place? What action can you propose, hum, hint, hint, uh, humans are taking that puts Mercury into food chains, specifically into the aquatic food chain? All right. So how do we do it? In the process, so this is, sorry, all of this is supplementary information. Take notes, anything if you want, if out of interest, okay? So when we burn coal and iron, okay, or burn coal, mining of iron, mercury, small amounts gets released into the air. But then when it hits the water, the bacteria will essentially do something called methylate it. It will bond a methyl group, okay, uh, to mercury. Now, the reason it's so risky is methylmercury can affect nervous systems uh, for the children. So they can be uh, born blind, speech problems, developmental delays, mental disabilities. Okay, so it is a real risk. So how does this happen? Scientists are still kind of figuring out the research on how exactly bacteria do it. Okay, but they, the process is called methylation. They're definitely bonding mercury to methyl group. And there's a bunch of reactions that scientists are still trying to investigate how it actually works. Okay. But they've been able to find certain proteins that they think are involved in the process of the bonding. Um, and I think the hope is to ultimately um, prevent future bonding um, so that this is not an issue for us in, in future years. Okay. Um, so here as well is another article link to kind of explain to you how this process occurred. Okay, so an image. So um, burning of coal or mining brings mercury into the water, but the bacteria converted to methylmercury. Now it's in the body of krill, eaten by salmon, eaten by trout, eaten by sharks. But notice for us, you can have a, essentially what they call an unlimited amount of salmon, oyster, pollock. It's such a tiny amount of methylmercury in here that it's at, of no risk to us. But every tuna has eaten hundreds of salmon. So now if we need hundreds of tuna, uh, we're, tr we're supposed to limit that to only a few times a week. And every single halibut has eaten hundreds of tuna themselves, which have eaten hundreds of salmon, which have eaten thousands of krill. So those we're supposed to be restricted to only a few times a month. And again, for pregnant women, it's supposed to be pretty much zero, okay? <clears throat> so again, here's a diagram representing how it can work its way in concentration up the food chain. So this PPB means parts per billion, okay? So for every billion water molecules, there is 0 0.02, okay? Um, so then what would that be? Oh my goodness, one, two. So it's essentially for every 100 billion um, water molecules, there would be two uh, pieces of, you know, methylmercury, let's say, okay? But as the producers absorb it and the primary consumers ingest the producers and the secondary consumers ingest the primary consumers, you'll notice that the concentration in each organism goes up essentially exponentially, okay? 20, 200, 20,000, okay? So it becomes toxic at the higher levels. So it actually affects the, the species it's meant to affect directly, but then also becomes toxic Later on, on the third or fourth trophic level, again, once it's accumulated in high enough concentrations. Okay. <clears throat> this uh, concept we've discussed before, okay? How DDT can bioaccumulate and bioamplify up the food chain and result in thin eggshells of different species of birds. And we looked at the bald eagles um, case study. So as a result of so much, so much DDT ingested by the eagles, they did not form solid enough eggshells. So the eggshells would break and crack, as you guys know. So here's my question. What do you think DDT is disrupting in the bald eagle biological processes, okay, to create thin eggshells? So think about egg. What chemical do you think eggshells are made up of? So ultimately, eggshells are made up of calcium, okay? So what DDT actually interfered with 
it actually interfered with calcium metabolism. So calcium would not work its way across the cell membranes into the egg itself. So that part of the, the biological process of creating eggs was faulty, essentially. So the calcium was not being transferred over the, over the cell membrane into the egg itself. So the shells were so thin because it was such a faulty, essentially, biological process. And that's why they would break. Okay. So this is just a little plug on the book Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, which taught us about the dangers of bioaccumulation of DDT. And because of that book, afterwards, it became a banned substance in many countries. Okay, so it has been said to save thousands and thousands of birds. It took until 1972 for banning in USA and Canada. And then there was a convention that actually banned it worldwide. And for us, just so we know, why is it dangerous for us directly? It's been found to cause cancers, infertility, miscarriages, developmental disabilities, nervous system damage. Okay. So I'm going to stop. I'm not stopping the lesson there, but I am transferring to some videos just so you can see how little the government knew about the risks of DDT. This was filmed, I think it's, oh my goodness, the years are 1940s, I think, 1945, 1950s, these were filmed, okay? So here we go. Let's take a look at what they used to think DDT, essentially they thought it was like the miracle drug, okay? Here we go. With the possibility of a grave infantile paralysis epidemic, San Antonio health authorities attacked germ carriers on a citywide front. With more discovered DDT and special sprayers, sections of the city are literally clogged with the insecticide in the fight to stop the spread of polio. Every suspected spot is sprayed. contributes one of its discoveries to save life. The intentions were good intentions. Um, what you're going to hear them referring to is poliomyelitis. So you can research it, but what they're trying to do ultimately is kill any kind of bacteria or pest that can transfer this polio to the children. Okay. But they were, they were spraying it. They were even eating it in one video that I, I watched as a demo to show that it is safe. Okay, but it took about 10 years for it to start to bioaccumulate and then so many dead fish and dead birds is kind of what ignited Rachel Carson to do some research. Why are there so many dead birds, dead fish? And it was realized that uh, they were actually getting killed from toxic levels of DDT, right? Because as you can see in this video, they're just spraying it right into the water. Okay, I'm going to show you a couple of more just for interest. Okay, so they called it the miracle pesticide. A couple more videos. This one is a little bit um, biased, so I'm, I'm just ignoring the part where they're hating so much on the government, but just showing you what they did here. Again, 1947. With the possibility of a 
serious ethical paralysis epidemic, health authorities of the city of San Antonio, Texas, and packed the germ carriers throughout the city. With the war discovered PDT and special sprayers, sections of the city are blanketed with the insecticide in the fight to stop the spread of the dread poliomyelitis. Every suspected spot is sprayed. Okay. So believe it or not, I can remember in my high school class seeing that visual of DDT sprayed on like sandwiches as children were eating. That, that memory stuck with me for decades. Okay, uh, let's continue. Sorry, give me a second. Okay, so now just to kind of be a little bit of devil's advocate, um, so as you can see, they didn't know the problems that they were causing, and they really were trying to see if there was a correlation between insect carrying, um, essentially, bacteria that could cause poliomyelitis. Okay, so they're trying to prevent that. And there has been research that has found that DDT is an effective killer of what? So let's go into the devil's advocate position quickly. What is DDT useful for? Specifically, how can it save human lives? Okay, so pause the video to discuss what is the way that DDT is useful to saving human, human lives. Okay, so in the past, DDT was used to successfully kill mosquitoes, which successfully decreased malaria. And that's the whole reason they were using it on the island of Borneo in the first place. Okay, so now let's think about the malaria stats then. Okay, so unrelated to pesticides and bioamplification, let's try to look at this in a different perspective. How many people get malaria every year? So the number is somewhere between 300 million, 600 million. How many people die from malaria every year? About a million. So this kind of just shows that there's always two sides to every story, two perspectives. There is reasons that people were using DDT in the past. It's just all the side effects of DDT were too much to go unnoticed. So you can formulate your own opinion here. If, if banning it worldwide is actually a good idea, maybe should we ban it in developing countries where we have, sorry, developed countries where we have things like antibiotics and not ban it in countries where we want to use DDT to prevent malaria spread? Do you think it should be a worldwide banning? I don't know, pros and cons here. What are your opinions? Okay, sucks because usually we would have the full on debate in class. Oh well. Okay, so here's another diagram here to showing how the concentration works its way up the food, way, food chain. Okay. All right, so let's show another video. Um, here we go. This one goes very quickly, but it, it kind of demonstrates biological magnification or bioaccumulation. I use those two terms interchangeably. Uh, so try to follow, okay? So let's take a look at how spraying wheat kills hawks. Here we go.
So, I mean, <laughs> that video I think shows it quite clearly, the side effects of biological magnification. So let's continue on. So let's just write that down. In conclusion, they'll impact more than just the pesticide they intend to kill. If you spray pesticide on wheat to kill the grasshoppers, that will kill the grasshoppers, but it will target non-target species, accumulate in the ones that eat the wheat, um, and then the mice, which are eaten by the weasels, which are eaten by the hawks, and therefore another species will die in addition to grasshoppers, which is it? The hawks. Okay. All right, and let's finish with one last video. This video is related to um, the concept of photo degrade, uh, photo degradation of uh, plastics, but they kind of briefly talked about this concept of how plastics can work their way up a food chain, which is kind of a concept of biological amplification. So that's why I saved it for this lesson. So here we go. Last video. This is the story of three plastic bottles, empty and discarded. Their journeys are about to diverge with outcomes that impact nothing less than the fate of the planet. But they weren't always this way. To understand where these bottles end up, we must first explore their origins. The heroes of our story were conceived in this oil refinery. The plastic in their bodies was formed by chemically bonding oil and gas molecules together to make monomers. In turn, these monomers were bonded into long polymer chains to make plastic in the form of millions of pellets. Those were melted at manufacturing plants and reformed in molds to create the resilient material that makes up the triplets' bodies. Machines filled the bottles with sweet, bubbly liquid, and they were then wrapped, shipped, bought, opened, consumed, and unceremoniously discarded. And now here they lie poised at the edge of the unknown. Bottle one, like hundreds of millions of tons of his plastic brethren, ends up in a landfill. This huge dump expands each day as more trash comes in and continues to take up space. As plastics sit there being compressed amongst layers of other junk, rainwater flows through the waste and absorbs the water-soluble compounds it contains, and some of those are highly toxic. Together, they create a harmful stew called leachate, which can move into groundwater, soil, and streams, poisoning ecosystems and harming wildlife. It can take bottle one an agonizing 1,000 years to decompose. Bottle two's journey is stranger, but unfortunately no happier. He floats on a trickle that reaches a stream, a stream that flows into a river, and a river that reaches the ocean. After months lost at sea, he's slowly drawn into a massive vortex where trash accumulates, a place known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Here, the ocean's currents have trapped millions of pieces of plastic debris. This is one of five plastic-filled gyres in the world's seas, places where the pollutants turn the water into a cloudy plastic soup. Some animals, like seabirds, get entangled in the mess. They, and others, mistake the brightly colored plastic bits for food. Plastic makes them feel full when they're not, so they starve to death, and pass the toxins from the plastic up the food chain. For example, it's eaten by lanternfish, the lanternfish are eaten by squid, the squid are eaten by tuna, and the tuna are eaten by us. And most plastics don't biodegrade which means they're destined to break down into smaller and smaller pieces called microplastics, which might rotate in the sea eternally. But Bottle 3 is spared the cruel purgatories of his brothers. A truck brings him to a plant where he and his companions are squeezed flat and compressed into a block. Okay, this sounds pretty bad too, but hang in there, it gets better. The blocks are shredded into tiny pieces, which are washed and melted, so they become the raw materials that can be used again. As if by magic, Bottle 3 is now ready to be reborn as something completely new. For this bit of plastic with such humble origins, suddenly, the sky is the limit. Beautiful video. Okay.
And now we are almost done the last section of the last lesson for ecology. Let's take a look at the last issue. So we have discussed non-target species as a problem. We have discussed, hold on, let me just double check our three that we're talking about here. Oh, right, non-target species, bioaccumulation, and now let's discuss pesticide resistance. Here we go. Okay, so let me verbally ex explain this first. As you know, the similar kind of concept happens with bacteria. This can also happen with pesticides. A pesticide uh, will be sent to kind of apply to kill a certain insect, sure. And it will kill probably almost all of that insect, great. The ones that survive are the ones that have natural defense mechanisms to survive it. They are either naturally stronger or they have some sort of adaptation that their you know, brothers and sisters did not have. So now when that insect replicates, it's going to pass on these genes that allowed it to be strong enough to withstand their pesticide. And therefore the next generation of pests will be able to withstand that same concentration of chemical, meaning we need to put a stronger chemical or stronger concentrations. So we have to put progressively more and more and more pesticide every generation in order to kill the same quantity of pests that we did before, okay? This is a very similar concept to how antibiotic resistance develops. Okay, so here we go. Pests reproduce quickly in very large numbers, high natality. So first, that is a fundamental key ingredient, okay? The ones that will survive will reproduce. So their offspring will also be able to survive the pesticide. So what must the farmer do to counteract it? You either have to switch to a different pesticide or apply higher concentrations of the original pesticide. Okay, so you have to either switch pesticides or use a higher concentration. So the next diagram will show kind of a visual of pesticide resistance developing. So you have a plant, you have pests eating that plant, pesticide administered, but the resistance one, the resist, oh goodness, the resistant ones will survive and then reproduce. And then you will apply the same pesticide again, but it will not affect them. Okay. So this is an actual graph showing over the years how the pest, uh, pesticide resistant species have increased. Okay. And this is a worldwide stat. Okay. So there is a technique called alternative agriculture. So think about it. I think you guys know what it's called when you try to grow crops without pesticide. What do we call it? Okay, organic farming. This is the alternative strategy that has come up, come about because of our knowledge of the risks of pesticides. After we saw the risks of DDT, bioaccumulation, bioamplification, all of this. So now organic produce is becoming much more popular. What is the con as a farmer? If you don't use pesticides, what is the major con? Ultimately, what is the major reason you want to use them? So yes, farmers will lose a large amount of their crop to pests. So the question is, how do they mitigate this problem? So what is one benefit though? Of no, sorry, sorry, so the con is you're gonna lose some of your crop. The benefit is you don't have to pay for pesticides, okay? So that's the benefit, okay? So you don't have to pay for the pesticides. And so how do organic farmers deal with the fact that a large amount of their crop is lost? The crop yield is lower than the pesticide using crops would be. What do you notice about organic food compared to non-organic? It is more expensive. Okay, so if you are an organic farmer, 
there are strategies that you can use to kill pests or to minimize pests without using pesticides. So on your table, you have terms, and I wanna see if you can understand what they would be. How can you control pests without the chemical pesticide? What do you think a biological control would look like? What are they doing to biologically control this pest? You are releasing their predators, okay? Ladybugs are predators. Certain wasps can be predators of pests. So this is called biological control. If you release these insects. Okay. What do you think altered timing refers to? How can you minimize pesticides with altered timing? So if you plant a crop outside of the typical peak pest population, you are less likely to have pests attacking the crop. So, you, so ultimately it's like you try to choose a crop that you can grow outside of pest population peak times, which nah, doesn't typically work because they've both adapted to each other, right? The reason the pest is around is because it's found that food source uh, during the time that it peaks. The next one we've discussed before, crop rotation. Why is that beneficial? So ultimately, if every single year you grow a different crop, you don't give the pest time to actually establish itself and grow out of control. So if you change up the crop every time, it's gonna take a new pest to come in to establish itself. So that won't be possible to have an overtaking um, pest population in that sort of situation. And the last one is called baiting. Do you have any idea how a farmer might bait a pest or distract a pest? Okay, does anyone know what it's called? Essentially, essentially it's a chemical that animals release to attract one another with. Do you know what those are called? So you can bait an insect by releasing certain pheromones. So they're gonna release this chemical pheromone into the air, then that's gonna make the insects think that it's time to mate. The insects are gonna look for their mate. They're gonna get all confused, essentially. So they try to bait the pest by releasing pheromones. And these artificial pheromones are going to make it difficult for the actual, um, for the insect to discern the real pheromones from the real insects so they can mate from the fake ones. So essentially, the poor little insects won't be able to find each other to reproduce to make their next population. Obviously, none of these are 100% effective because we still have lower crop yields from organic agriculture, okay? So if we really want to talk about sustainability and be real about human population, even though organic farming is ideal, it is not sustainable for our human population. We cannot sustain our population if every single thing went organic. So the suggestion is called integrated pest management. Okay. It's kind of a concept of doing both. Okay. So organic farming is not sustainable. But if you use some of these techniques, you can use less pesticide, okay? So if you use some synthetic pesticides when necessary, but in low concentrations, because you're doing everything you can, okay, to um, control the pests, whether it's biological control, altered timing, crop rotation, or baiting, the theory is you'd need to use less pesticide as a result, okay? All right, everybody. That is it for us. Um, I know this is a longer lesson. Hopefully you stayed awake for all of it. Have a great week. I hope you are all working hard on their final project. I will give you one more small assignment for this week, but then that's pretty much it from me, okay? I might throw out a couple of climate change lessons just in case Mr. Van Mendel says he didn't get around to it, uh, but those will just be to sit back and watch for interest and you know, hopefully for fun. Remember, learning for learning's sake. Okay, have a great day, everybody.